Dear students, in today's lecture we will talk about microbial symbiosis which means that microbes exist with other beings which may be microbial in nature or may be higher order of life forms in perfect harmony with each other and harmony in sense that the microbes give something of benefit to the other life living being they are um, living in close association with and the other living being also benefits the microbes. So this is a win-win situation and this win-win situation results in some very close associ associations of microbes with other life forms that at the first glance might actually be even um, not distinguishable. So these indistinguishable close relationships that microbes have with other life forms can be of different types. We have talked about parasitism where microbes are parasitic, they hurt other microbes, that is their close association. We have talked about commensalism where they live together happily without affecting each other much. And now today we are going to talk about symbiotic relationships where microbes dwell inside an organism or very close to it and very close association and there is mutual benefit. And we will get started with our the first example which is the lichen. Now lichen is a very interesting um, um, relationship between a phototrophic um, living being and a fungus. So the phototrophic living being could be an algae or it could be cyanobacteria. If you remember we talked about cyanobacteria being able to trap the light energy of the sun and convert it into food. So um, this is a very interesting relationship and now let us talk about lichen. I am pretty sure that if you have wandered around in the wild or seen at seen the places that still have rock croppings like such as this one, forest areas, old wood, you must have definitely seen lichen. Lichen comes in different morphologies and here are only two pictures of lichen. This is the lichen growing on rock and this is the lichen growing on the bark of tree. It does not always look as pretty as this one or as brown as this one. So I encourage you at this point to go around and check on the internet the different morphologies and colors of lichen and perhaps uh, go around your own community and find where you can see the lichen outgrowth. Now the important thing about lichen is that as I mentioned just a bit ago that this is a association between fungus and a phototrophic bacteria. So this is your um, fungal hyphae where the fungus is, um, this is your fungus by the way and then the phototrophic, um, the phototrophic microbes will live very close to it embedded within the fungus. So, uh, so neatly embedded with each other that they are very difficult to actually um, distinguish. For example, if we zoom into this particular portion of the uh, picture, you notice that these are your fungal hyphae, so this is fungus in yellow and the green cherry sitting on the top is your phototrophic bacteria or algae. So um, phototrophic bacteria as I mentioned before could be cyanobacteria or it could be algae. Now why do algae or cyanobacteria form this intimate relationship with fungus? Has fungus kidnapped these phototrophic microbe or is it willingly um, and beneficially this relationship has been set up? Now if you notice that the, whether it is on a rock, on a wall or on the bark of a tree, um, the lichen is growing on exposed areas, areas exposed to the air. The other thing to note is that the medium on which the lichen is growing, again whether it is bark, rock or wall is not very nutrient rich, it is usually very dry. And in dry places, it is not easy for algae or for cyanobacteria to grow. If you remember, I have shown you pictures of cyanobacteria growing in river, in lake, we have talked about algal blooms in water media, what surface water uh, bodies. But algae will not find it very easy to grow on a bark, a rock or on the wall. So in that case, the fungus, what a fungus does it, fungus makes this beautiful structure of hyphen but not necessarily beautiful to humans but very beneficial for the fungus and the phototrophic microbe. They make this structure which traps hydro, um, traps water and prevents dehydration of it. Thus these cyanobacteria have plenty of moisture around them and if they are algae they are plenty of moisture around them and they never feel lack of water. Also the other thing that uh, other way in which these phototrophic microbes benefit from um, as so their close association with fungus is that if you remember how fungus feeds it releases chemicals acids mostly which degrade 
whatever complex uh, organics are present if it is in case of wood or if it is concrete then it corrodes the concrete we have talked about oxalic acid from fungus concrete uh, um, corroding the concrete in that case certain nutrients whether micronutrients macronutrients sugars or some other nutrients are released which are eaten by fungus and also are available for the phototrophic microorganism to consume thus if we talk about phototrophic organism which could be algae or cyanobacteria then the benefits are it receives water which it will not receive if it is trying to grow on a rock or on a wall. The other thing is it at times depending on where it is growing it will receive nutrients especially if it is growing on a wood or a bark of a tree. So, if you see some kind of algal growth on your wall you can be rest assured and it is not very wet you can be rest assured it is not just fungus but there perhaps is some kind of phototrophic microbe in it. Now another thing that that another question that should be pretty obvious is okay these are the things that our phototrophic microorganism is benefiting from what is fungus benefiting from. Now fungus um, cannot make its own food it needs to degrade fruit from its surroundings. So, it is already trying to degrade wood and it is trying to degrade concrete or it is trying to degrade rock. In case of concrete and rock we know that fungus will not get enough electron donors and will not get enough carbon source to survive and thrive and make this beautiful or let us say just this uh, marvelous lichen structures and forms. So, if what the phototrophic microbes do is that they are exposed to um, light and they receive um, they receive light and they make their own food and when they make their food they share it with the fungus. So, the fungal, m m the fungal uh, member receives food. from cyanobacteria or algae that it has associated with. Thus, it is a win-win situation fungus is getting its food, cyanobacteria is getting its water and nutrients whether it is micronutrient or macronutrient. And this is the first um, uh, uh, close association that we are talking today in the lecture the lichen. The next we want to talk about is a consortium. This often happens in the stratified lake. So, in stratified lakes you remember light can penetrate from some distance to uh, towards the uh, towards the bottom of the lake and then it cannot. So, t at the top of the surface of the lake we might have phototrophic organisms. Also oxygen can only penetrate and remain dissolved in water up to some depth. So, there we will have aerobic organisms and then as we go deeper we will have anoxic and anaerobic environment. So, in stratified lakes the mixing is not very common or hardly present. Now, in these kind of lakes we often see uh, epi uh, consortium of microbes. Now, this consortia often includes uh, two kinds of members one is motile and the other is non motile. So, one of them can move the other cannot move. Now, in stratified why in stratified lakes consortia is so important because in stratified lakes as time progresses the depth and the area where a nutrient is available changes. So, for example, let us say this is our lake. Okay, so, this is our lake and at the top here we have the phototrophic layer which is rich in oxygen and it is rich in light. So, most probably we have phototrophy present we have aerobic um, um, microorganisms and life forms present. Now, maybe the big given the uh, let us say the water is really clear and the light can penetrate here also. So, here we will have anaerobic or anoxic uh, phototrophic organisms. Then as we proceed we will have anoxic zone where microbes that uh, reduce nitrate, sulfate and other electron acceptors will be present. And then as we go towards the bottom we will have anaerobic zones where f the conditions would be very um, nice for fermentation and methanogenesis. Alrighty. So, as time progresses the oxygen here let us say there is no mixing. So, the oxygen will start getting depleted and the and the um, the depth at which the oxygen rich aerobic layer ends will move up. The depth at which as the nutrients in the anoxic zone such as nitrate and sulphate get reduced 
the depth at which anoxic zone ends will move up and similarly the depth at which anaerobic zone begins will move up. So, over time we will notice that our new aerobic zone has perhaps moved up. Similarly, our new anoxic zone has moved up and now there, is, there are larger portions that are in fermentative and methanogenic stage. Now, in this case microbes that survive best in presence of oxygen, what will they do? A microbe that survive best in presence of uh, electron acceptors such as nitrate and sulphate, what will they do? They need to find a way to move as the layers of the lake move. So, the, in that, that is the reason why motility is of utmost importance for survival of the cell. So, there are certain cells that are not non-motile and non-motile cells well if they cannot move they will die out. So, now non-motile cells they enter a relationship with motile cells which stick around it and, um, and develop some kind of relationship with it. And when these motile cells move by default the non-motile cell moves also. So, let us take a look here. Now, this is your epibion the green and brown cells that you notice here are your um, phototrophic bacteria uh, and the tail here that you are noticing is actually a flagellum of non phototrophic motile bacteria. So, because if the phototrophic bacteria requires light to survive, but these are non motile so they cannot move and at the inside at their core they have here a rod shaped motile non phototrophic bacteria. Now, because it is non phototrophic it does not require exposure to light. So, it will allow as many motile cells as can stick to it to stick around its periphery. Then when the time comes to move towards um, light rich area let us say the turbidity changes with season or the amount of sunlight that is available changes with season. In that case this kind of microbe requires to move up or below um, the depth at which it is present. So, uh, then these microbes will stick to this motile uh, microbe the rod like microbe and when the time has come to move it will use its flagella to either move up or to move down. Now, notice that I mentioned here that both of them are phototrophic whether they are green colored or whether they are brown colored both these epibionts are phototrophic. Now, the, the uh, conventional perception or the typical perception of phototrophy is the green color, but it can be either green or brown or different colors depending on the type and the quantity or percentage of the bacterial chlorophyll that is present in the micro. Now, um, now, notice here that we have epibionts mentioned here and that is for a good reason because epi means outside, bionts means alive organisms. So, organisms that stick outside to you are epibionts. Now, um, usually the way it works is that uh, the non-motile the this one the ones that are on the periphery they are phototrophic sulfur bacteria. their color might change depending on the kind of bacterial chlorophyll and then these are your motile non phototrophic bacteria. Now, uh, one thing to notice that we have talked about this in previous lecture that these epibionts which are your sulfur bacteria green sulfur bacteria they all belong to a particular of uh, um, microbe and that is known as chloribi. If you remember that they all belong to chloribi, they all are obligately anaerobic. So, if we come here they will exist in this anaerobic zone where the light can still travel. So, this is where they would like to exist no oxygen present and the light can still penetrate this is where they would like to be present. And the other thing is uh, not, no, uh, important about them is they are found across the globe they are not limited by geography anywhere there is stratification of water and they, because the water is stratified there is a need to move as conditions move. If water is not stratified it means that there is good level of mixing going on and when there is mixing the nutrition is likely to be available throughout the year throughout the uh, life span of the microbe. But when it is not available then the non-motile phototrophic bacteria love to combine with the motile non-phototrophic bacteria and allow it to carry them to more uh, productive areas, nutrient rich areas. Now, okay, so this is the benefit that the phototrophic bacteria are getting from attaching to a motile non phototrophic bacteria. What is non phototrophic bacteria gaining from this relationship? 
the obvious answer is food. The phototrophic bacteria convert light into food and now they share this food with the uh, motile non phototrophic bacteria. So, it is almost like a bus ride that they get, but uh, once they have reached to a nutrient rich area they do not cleave away very quickly because um, either because their lifespan is over or that um, uh, the need to move again might arrive very quickly. Alrighty, so these are different examples of a consortium. Now, the next example we want to look at is plants as microbial habitat. We have briefly talked about this how nitrogen fixing bacteria allow the um, plants such as soybean and other legumes to fix nitrogen and make protein rich um, grains, protein rich seeds legume. Now, this is an example of soybean root nodules. Now, if you pull out a root of legumes and soybean and other plants that are fixing nitrogen from air and convert and making new nitrogen rich food for us, then um, you will notice these nodules kind of structure on them. And here is the beauty, these nodules are a result of a bacterial infection, but the more nodules we see, the more bacterial infection we notice in a plant, the healthier the plant appears to be and also the more productive it appears to be. So, when we uh, do my sequencing of these root nodules and we sequence the these components, now how would we sequence? We will tear them off, we will weigh them, we will extract the DNA, we will um, attach the right adapters, you know, we will split the DNA into right length and then attach, attach the right adapters and then sequence it using third generation or fourth generation sequencing technique. And when we sequence them we find uh, not apart from the typical root micro genetic sequences that we will get that is now this is soybean. So, apart from the typical soybean sequences we find quite a rich diversity of bacterial sequences and many of them the, at least the ones that I have shown here in this picture are rhizobium leguminosarum. So, named very appropriately found in the rhizobium of the legume and uh, however, we have we know now that this bacteria that uh, colonize these infected root nodules are very diverse. They can be even proteobacteria and different kinds of microbes actually. So, we can use our sequencing techniques to find out what kind of microbes are um, infecting the root. Now, how does it work out? How does the infection take place? and how does it help plant health and improve its productivity. Alrighty, this is how it usually works. This is your healthy root. This is healthy root in sense, it is prior to infection. Now, when we talk of human health, usually if we get infected, then this is bad, we are unhealthy. But in case of legumes, if they get infected by the right microbe, it is really good for them. So, look here, this is your typical root and then there are tiny, tiny root here that are present in any healthy root and the root has rhizobial cells on it. Now, what happens is that um, these um, root hair they secrete certain chemicals which attract the rhizobium microbes to it. Now, these rhizobium uh, microbes they um, are identified recognized by the root hair that ah yes yeah, this is the root uh, microbe that I was looking for. Now, when the uh, microbe has now this is the blue microbe uh, enlarged at the tip of this enlarged here. So, when um, the uh, microbes have uh, at, microbes have attached to your root hair, then they release knot factors. Now, these knot factors what they do is that they uh, allow the microbes to invade into the root cells, into the root hair. So, now this is the invasion, the invasion step where the bacteria actually invade. Now, when the bacteria invade this root, they encourage the cells to grow rapidly. So, now this is the infection has happened in the root. So, this has been infected. Once the infected has infection has happened, the plant cells are now hijacked by the bacteria and they are stimulated to divide faster and faster. Now, when they divide faster and faster, they make a lump, a tumor like lump, which we call as root nodule. Now, um, now this root nodule, uh, um, this, this root nodule um, is formed, and once it is formed, the bacteria utilize this to fix nit to serve as the perfect environment for fixing nitrogen and sending it to the letting the plant uptake it. Now, we know that the plant is benefiting from this despite spending more energy in making this tumor like root nodule growth, it benefits from it because it gets rich amount of nitrogen food fixed nitrogen from atmosphere that it can now make 
nitrogen rich legumes, it can make nitrogen rich fruits and seeds. The question is how is bacteria benefiting from it? Well, the bacteria benefits from it because the plants in turn, because they are phototrophic and they make food very easily, share glucose and other food with the microbes. So microbes fix the nitrogen for them and plants uh, receive food, uh, give them food in return. So now let us look at the infection of a root cell a little bit more in detail. The first step is that the roots, as I mentioned earlier, they emit a chemical signal that will attract the rhizobium bacteria. So in this first step, the root hair has uh, emitted a signal and the rhizobium bacteria, these tiny black dots have been invited and look there is actually an incision here in between the root hair and they are going in deep here and now this root hair has become infected. So once um, the root uh, rhizobium bacteria have been attracted to the root hair, the bacteria starts desecreting chemical signals which force the or which hijack the cell that oh grow faster, grow faster, elongate and when they uh, elongate further, they actually create an invagination, so a kind of, uh, of a tube inside the root hair and then they penetrate it. And now once they have penetrated, the infection can go, this is infection invagination, it can go and it can uh, make bacteroids, so bacteroids inside the root hair. Now these are, these root hair are dividing really fast, they are in the root cortex. Now, now since they have uh, uh, reached here, the vesicles that contain the bacteria um, will, will um, hijack the root cell that okay, let us divide faster and faster. Now they and they divide in the pericycle of the steel um, part of the root and then the growth continues. See now this is the growth is continuing and these are the cells that have bac bacter uh, bacteroids in them in the vesicles. So it, if you remember the uh, virus infection, how virus enters the cell, it can do two things. It can either become part of the chromosome or it can make multiple copies and divide. Now here the bacteria enters a eukaryotic cell which is a root cell, stays there in a vesicle. Now vesicle is a, um, a membrane like structure which allows something to stay isolated from rest of the cell so the root cell does not kill the bacteria and they ask it to divide faster and faster. So these uh, pericycle of steel cells are dividing faster and faster in the root cortex and more and more of them have bacteria in their vesicles and all of them are hijacked and they keep dividing, keep dividing, now they are infected so they make a tumor like outgrowth. They, it will continue to grow and vascular tissue continuing to the, the nodule to xylem and the phloem of the steel would develop. So now this is developing the vascular system so now they can have, this is nodule vascular tissue so they can have a uh, good input of uh, nutrient and they can share whatever uh, nutrients that they have. So this is, uh, it will allow the uh, transportation of nutrients. So the nitrogenous compounds are transported from uh, nodule to the rest of the plant and the water and other nutrition is um, shared with the um, root nodule. So this is how um, uh, root legumes, they, um, how this is how the legumes actually are colonized by bacteria and this is a very healthy infection. So, as agriculture, uh, in agriculture we want our roots to be infected by the bacteria. Now I have mentioned here, our microbiological studies and new tools have given us, give us an idea of what kind of microbes tend to colonize the roots and form these root nodules and we also know what kind of microorganisms, micro commu microbial communities allow more root nodules to form, are more virulent in, or more pathogenic and form uh, more root nodules which result in, which translate in better health and higher productivity. So now we can do a sort of a probiotic approach where if we want to encourage root nodules, we can actually take the strains that encourage it more, inoculate them around the root and the next thing we will know is lot of root nodules present in our uh, root system and that will benefit the, um, that will benefit the plant and would benefit the uh, farmer. Alrighty students, this is all for today. In the next class, we will be moving on towards public health and how as human beings and as animals, different animals such as cow also, you have very close relationships with microbes and how we utilize them for our better health. Thank you.